Hold on to your butts. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Wesker demands. Now this affects Iris. Um, Iris, where are you? What you feel only matters to you. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Iris, I have a tip for you. Don't take drugs! Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host, Iris, and I am here with my older brother. Wesley, and today we're discussing a film from 2021, Guillermo del Toro's Indiana Jones and the Nightmare of Natty Gan. <laughs> wow, that's a lot of film references. We got The Journey of Natty Gan, Indiana Jones, and I assume The Temple of Doom, and... <laughs> There was one more you worked in there? Well, Nightmare Alley, the Tyrone Powers film from like 1947. Yes, this is a remake, now playing only in theaters, and they're not joking. But we are in the midst of award season and wanted to bring to our devoted and loyal listeners our discussion on Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley. So, Wes, did you like Shape of Water? Let's start there. Does anyone like Shape of Water? It has Michael Shannon. I like that. It has Doug Jones or whatever, Creepy Fish Man. He's cool. He's been in a bunch of stuff. But it was like all Guillermo del Toro movies, it's kind of gross. Like it was supposed to be sexy fish man story or something <laughs> and lonely wannabe fish lady. Um, as a love story, it played icky for me. I'll be up front and say Shape of Water was not my thing. In fact, I kind of hated it, but now I don't really <laughs> remember why. Like, I kind of wonder if it's worth a revisit because I do remember that John Dion was passionate about it. Writer, director John Dion, whom I've worked with for many years, just thought it was a perfect movie. And I was like, ew. I equate Guillermo del Toro movies to childbirth. In a way, this is from a dude perspective who had never given birth. <laughs> but from an outside perspective, it's uh, it's a part of life and it's beautiful, as all Guillermo del Toro movies are, but also kind of disgusting. It's unpleasant and bloody and leaves a bad taste in your mouth, I guess. But somehow you forget about it and then end up wanting to do it again later. <laughs> all of his movies are shot really well. Beautiful. He's... Yeah, he's generally referred to as an auteur or a visionary and movies like Pan's Labyrinth and even the Hellboys in The Shape of Water and Nightmare Alley. Nightmare Alley was gorgeously shot. The images were super evocative and clear and clean and it felt tangible. I mean, he also is the guy responsible for Pacific Rim, which was super cartoony and like neon monsters and stuff. We, we mentioned that Kaiju and the big monsters in Pacific Rim might have been a direct inspiration for the way more colorful and neon Godzilla versus Kong, mm, mm -hmm. where it was like red neon versus blue neon. Right. But this one felt very real, almost zero special effects that I could tell. They definitely had some electricity effects in... Um, in molly's uh, stage show yeah yeah for sure it just didn't feel like a big fake green screen set or whatever but you cannot deny that he's a skilled filmmaker in terms of visual appeal and knowing that it's no accident when he's standing in front of the fire in his little fedora there's no way that anyone who's ever watched movies didn't be like whoa that's like indiana jones oh he also tips the hat over his eyes when he's on the bus all Indiana Jones on the plane style. And I just cannot see that it's the same era. And then also the Journey of Natty Gan thing where it seemed like it was going to be kind of a wandering parable in depression or post-depression early war era and stuff. Kind of hard to pin down this because carnies apparently don't change because all carnivals look the same. But you would assume when Molly leaves him once and for all and for good and goes back to Hellboy and the Hellboy family that she would have returned to the carnival. And I thought yeah. that was the carnival. No, I think Tim Blake Nelson was a new carny with a new carnival. And he said that he got the pickle baby. <laughs> I'm sorry. I really don't know how else to refer to that thing. <laughs> it was a carnival uh, biological specimen. Yes, that was preserved in, I presume, formaldehyde. And he said, I got that from a 10-in-1 that folded, and I thought it was pretty neat. 
you know, I'm paraphrasing, but I didn't know what a 10 in one was. I'm, I assumed it, it, it's like a car, it's carny speak for carnival. And he said that it folded. So basically the other carnival, the original carnival went under, they had a fire sale and uh, he picked up that little curio and put it in his office. Okay. But based on that obscure terminology, that's pretty thin. It's just, look, we got to get him full circle, got to get him back to being the geek, but it can't be the same carnival because they would know who he is and Molly would be there. So it's got to be a different carnival. So the other one folded and the same thing is in place. The same geek spiel is in place and the same pickled baby (laughs) is in place. (laughs) Well, yeah, all the carny stuff is like, that's for real handed down. That's like practitioner to practitioner. Like all that stuff is all inherited, right? Yeah, and that was also beautifully laid out. This is kind of Guillermo del Toro's terrain, the magical slash magical realism fantasy type of vibe. And so I was waiting for that to be a thing. I was like, okay, the carnies are pretending to be special thingies, but they're actually really freaks and magic people and sorcerers and junk. And then it wasn't. Yeah, I was waiting for that to happen too. Every single thing was explained away. It really grounded this movie, not just in terms of realism because of the way that it was shot and the way that not many tricks were pulled on us, but everything was so laboriously explained and they made a point of showing us that this world is real and practical. Nobody's magical, not even him. And in the way he comes up to be a flourishing, what do they call him? A mentalist, mentalist. or a trickster, you know, con, kind of the, the con artist that he ultimately became in trying to swindle Grindle, Ezra Grindle, was all <laughs> skill based, right? And he's like an up and comer and he's a hard worker and all that stuff who yeah. dedicates himself to the trade and, and I guess kills everybody <laughs> who stands in his way. Uh, yeah, very prestige like in this sense that the magic and the illusion is presented for an audience and for us and for our enjoyment, but also we get the behind the scenes look. We're not talking about a spook show. We're talking about, you know, entertainment for entertainment's sake. But I bring all this up because this is my GM. I love magic. I love movies about magic. I love to go to the magic castle. I did magic lessons at the magic castle. And it was really cool to see such a visionary like Guillermo del Toro play in this world. And it was so much fun. I mean, which is a weird word, weird adjective to describe Nightmare Alley. (laughs) So you were jazzed by the magic and the carny aspect of it, but it doesn't start that way. It starts with Indiana Jones burning a body in silence. And you're like, he's a bad guy, which I guess ultimately Stan, of course, ended up being. But he also goes from bad, silent, stoic type. And it actually made me think Bradley Cooper might not be a bad choice to pull Indiana Jones moving forward. You know, he's got decent enough good looks. Decent enough. He's a little bit wooden, I think. Bradley Cooper, in your movies, in the Hangover stuff, he's pretty dude bro and very animated. But I don't think he's a terribly amazing, dynamic, nuanced actor. He's a little bit like Leonardo DiCaprio, where he ju- he's just kind of there a little bit for me. I disagree. I think Bradley Cooper arrived in Nightmare Alley. And I kind of thought that in A Star is Born. But I think he bit off a little bit more than he could chew with A Star is Born, like with the music, with the directing, with the acting. But I kind of feel like as an actor, as a nuanced, dramatic actor, that he arrived in Nightmare Alley. So then help me out here with the tone, how it's set up. Because the way Guillermo del Toro presents his character, he is at first obviously a bad guy, doesn't say a word, eventually comes around to be the charming talky dude who's like talking Molly right out of the carny and into his car off to see the wizard or whatever. But he was kind of set up as the silent murderer, right? Like tonally, the way he was presented, did he track accurately? Like this is who this person is and he's, it's just a different part of his personality because I felt like this movie set us up for a little bit of confusion. You didn't feel that way? No, because I thought that the filmmakers set up Stanton as an observationist and those skills and powers of observation are what directly translate into making him a great mentalist. And he undoubtedly was a great mentalist. And he, so, you know, he he arrived at the carnival, needed a couple bucks and needed a hot meal, and then watched. And he watched and he listened and he took it all in and you could see the wheels turning and him kind of becoming who he was meant to become. Fair enough. So I'm going to transition 
into a more meditative role, and I'm going to reflect on this movie by way of questions to you. Okay, oh, ready? Interesting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did Stan kill the David Strathairn character to get the book? Yeah. And boy, was everybody in this movie. David Strathairn, this weird kind of cameo-ish role. He's so good. He's so good, and he just gets picked off, and you're like, oh, it makes it some all the more painful. Yes, he killed him. Yeah. He purposefully... Now, what I don't understand is why the bottles... Why you put the poison bottles next to the drinking bottles? Like, don't you put the poison bottles a couple boxes away from the drinking bottles, at least? I guess. I mean, is it a different shaped bottle? Is that how you know? <laughs> There's the look... flasky bottle versus the round bottle? They looked, the wino bottle? They looked the same, and we never got a... I mean, Willem Dafoe is doing his tour. We never get a close-up of said bottles. But Pete was very open, right? He was willing to teach and mentor Stan. Yes. But he was also protective about his little book. And maybe he wanted to dole out the secret in his own time as opposed to just opening the book wide to Stanton. And that didn't work for Stan's timeline. So he did away with him. And it seemed like nobody questioned it. I don't know. I mean, he as protective as he was of the book, he knows by observing people well enough that he was totally going to lure Stan in by hinting at the significance of this book and then just leaving it right next to him on the nightstand when he passes out drunk under the stage or whatever. <laughs> He's just tempting. He's just tempting him right there. He's tempting fate. Because everyone was so present and everyone was so aware, I wondered about the motivations of some of these people. It all felt like the con. It all felt like them luring them into each other's traps. Mm -hmm. They're all con people. Why did Willem Dafoe start showing Stan his pickling stash? He was like, oh, we're going to tour the carnival. Got to show you what's what, young man. This is where I keep my pickled fetuses. <laughs> it's like the big short. Where Steve Carell is like, I don't get it. Why is he confessing? And the dudes are like, they're not. He's bragging. They're bragging. And it's like, this is this dude's world. This is the world that he's built, that he's collected over time. And he's got a young buck. I think they referred to him like that. Uh, who's interested. And, you know, the, this stuff only lives with, because it's passed down from generation to generation. So I could see why Willem Dafoe would want to take a wayward guy like Stan under his wing. Okay. So when he's introduced to the geek character, which is elaborately set up, Stan says, poor soul. Right. He has sympathy, and that yeah. was kind of an eye-opener for me in terms of his character, because up until then, he was just the silent murderer waiting to spring, waiting to unleash havoc on this carnival that was then, he was going to awaken the demon, and all the freaks in the carnival were going to shed their skin and be all like Sardo Noomspa and come after him, right? I thought he was going to go in, he was going to be a bad guy who's a human bad guy, and was going to go into the carnival and start killing people and stir up all the evil. <laughs> I mean, given Guillermo del Toro's track record, I don't think you're that far off. The question is, Stan is a sympathetic guy. He's well, not a murderer monster. I don't know that he's across the board a sympathetic guy, but he has compassion for the geek because we find out later he sees so much of himself in that poor, unfortunate soul. Poor, unfortunate soul. Okay. So sad, but true. Stanton was the guy that observed, and he saw all the angles on all the people. He saw how the Tony Collette and the David Strathane character could kind of further what he was trying to accomplish. They were sort of unceremoniously left behind. He becomes a grifter and a mentalist and an illusionist on his own. And then he has the gift. I thought maybe he's going to unlock his X-Man superpower potential. In learning the tricks, he will break the code to where he actually becomes the mentalist right and that's his role in the carnival or something and then he collapsed why did he collapse do you think dramatic effect yeah, so it was fake it was staged yeah okay there were a few times where it led me into thinking that this was going to end up being supernatural and then invariably they would explain they would take us to a threshold uh, of suspension of disbelief and then bring us back by explaining it it was a little bit mm. like doyle's trick of making Sherlock Holmes seem superhuman. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, Guillermo del Toro was meticulous about laying out this whole thing. Mm. Um, what was our inciting incident in this movie? Because I'm going to argue that it was actually when we got to Ezra Grindel. 
and him paying lots of money and Stan trying to convince him that he's in communication with Grindel's dead wife and trying to get that money out of him and avoiding being cut. Were those the stakes of this movie? Hmm. I'm going to go out on a limb and say the stakes in this movie were Stanton's soul. And when that was set up, pretty early on. I do agree that the movie doesn't get momentum until Ezra Grindel's introduced. But I forgive it. I forgive the movie for that hour, hour and a half of exposition because it was necessary. It did bring him to the place where you believed you understood what the Stan character was. Correct. And you understood what was at stake with Ezra Grindle, and you know that he was warned against the spook show. And it was brought to my attention that Stan is always in search of and then burning through, quite literally, these father figures that he has. <laughs> quite literally. <laughs> He's betrayed by his dad. But there were like half a dozen of them from Bruno to the Willem Dafoe character to the David Strathairn character to uh, the first guy that he cons and then ultimately to Richard Jenkins' Grin Grindle. A lot of father-esque figures. Tim Blake Nelson at the end. Yeah, uh, Buster Scruggs himself. <laughs> but we have to move along to what ultimately is the core of this story. And it's not Molly and Stan, but it's Stan and Kate Blanchett. Wait, wait, what, sorry, what's her name? Dr. Lilith Ritter. He ultimately gets to Dr. Ritter's office, and she is just a means of introduction to her high profile clients that he can ultimately fleece for money. But what was her deal? Oh, I guess that that's man. kind of a broad, open ended question. Oof. Where do we begin? Basically, in, in summation, Stanton meets his match and is bested. I mean, she plays him from the moment they come into contact with one another. Whereas Stanton is a bootstrapper and Dr. Ritter is definitely not. She's educated. She's refined. She's obviously clever. Why would he think he could con her? Because it was the 1940s and she was a woman. There's an interesting balance of her showing her strength and pretending that she doesn't understand. And that's part of the game. And he was so confident in his powers that he overlooked that she was using the same techniques. So she delivers him the mark, right? The first rich guy who's married to Claire. Mary Steenburgen. So awesome to see her. And then he brings her the money. And she does the age old trick of saying, I don't want the money. It's not about the money. I'm interested in you as a specimen. I want to find out what makes you tick. And she's conning him. And he's too prideful to realize it. It definitely seemed to get to his position where he was confident as a mentalist. It seemed like he felt he was always in the driver's seat, right? He was always the one running the con. He was always two steps ahead of everybody else. Right. And doesn't even realize because he's maintaining that position for himself and self-assuming the role of leadership that there's no way she could be a step ahead of him without him knowing. Right. Right. It's his blind spot. Yeah, And so the hubris plays into his character in a big way. And you see how he came to that position. But she was she entered in halfway and she was anomalous in the sense that her motivations were less clear. Did you get a sense, aside from her ultimately bearing her scars to him, of why she was the way she was? We get that she came from a hard place, that she has her own trauma and her own baggage. But we've talked about this, like the con man or the crook. These cons and these crimes take as much work and effort and intelligence. And if these people just applied themselves to doing good, like imagine how much good they could do. Like she just seemed sure. like a bad apple who applied her position, her intelligence, all of these things for the con, for the power. Imagine the circus they could have started. <laughs> it seems like when Stan meets someone, he's trying to get an idea of who they are. He's observing them so that he can find the angle, right? Find the chink in the armor, find his way in so he can get out of them what he needs. It's an interesting dance that they do. He and the Dr. Ritter character, she reveals some things to him. He reveals some things to her. She's good at not showing all her cards. And for her character, I think that's fine. For the movie, I didn't know she was important except for the fact that she was Kate Blanchett. Mm -hmm. 
And so when they went into that dance they did, this exchange of information, there were no stakes and there was nothing to indicate that we had finally reached a culmination of his experience where he would have to face off against a worthy adversary. Mm. All I really saw, I was just concerned for Molly mm. and I could see the concerned glances from Molly where she had noted that Stan had met his equal in a, in a woman and it wasn't her. Mm -hmm. That was kind of a bummer. Yeah. What did she say? Like, I know that you think that she's class, like he is, she's the class that he's aspired to, that he right. thinks that he is deserving of. You know, he obviously looks down on the carnies when they come to the hotel room or their apartment to visit. Like he's above them now. You know, he's climbing the social ladder and you can feel the hurt when she says that because she, even though they're co-creators in this show and they're doing major hotel ballrooms and whatnot... She knows where she's come from and who she is. But Dr. Ritter positions herself as a love interest, which isn't at all what she's looking for, but which is another way she knows to effectively play him. Like, he knows that, as Tony Collette's Xena put it, he's easy on the eyes, even if he is just an Oki with strict teeth. Like, she uses that. Like, of course he would assume that she would be into him. And she uses that to her advantage, Dr. Ritter. Yeah, it's his hubris, assuming that he can move up to her station in life. But that was kind of his thing. But of course, with the pride, with hubris comes the fall. And ultimately, spoiler, when Dr. Ritter shoots him Oof. in the ear, I didn't know why. Why did she shoot him? She didn't. I don't think she intended to shoot him in the ear. I think she intended to shoot him between the eyes. And then she could very easily make a case for self-defense and maintained the ruse that this was a dude who lost his mind and tried to attack her. And she was defending herself. She was very calculated because she also has the evidence on tape of him losing his temper. But why did she want to kill him? Well, she wanted to keep the money. You know, he found out. She showed her hand. She says, I love you, Stan. And he turns around because he knows that she's lying. And she says, did I, was it too much? Like overplay it or something? Yes, I tried too hard. But because she misplays that moment, he realizes in that moment that she's conning him. He looks in the bag already knowing that the money's not there. So at that point, she has no choice. She either has to get him caught or she needs to kill him. My problem with Guillermo del Toro movies has always been thin character development. Stan is far and away. What, what's his real name? Stanfield? Stan, Stan, for, Stanard, Stanard, what's his name? Stanton. Stanton Stan, Carlisle. Stanton. Far and away. He was like Guillermo del Toro being like, I'm going to make a really balanced, explained, and thoughtful character. And nobody's going to stop me. And how much of that was Bradley Cooper as an emerging or arriving filmmaker and as a producer on Nightmare Alley? Uh, fair enough. And he's a, an accomplished director and has had lots of good roles. But I think, like Leonardo DiCaprio, this movie kind of happens around him. And he's a reactionary actor. Do I see the world and the upbringing in Stan's eyes? Not really. Bradley Cooper, he's a pretty dude, but he looks kind of dead behind the eyes to me. <laughs> like an American psychotype. I felt like Stan was a deliberately, painstakingly rounded character, but Dr. Ritter was an entirely different matter. And Guillermo del Toro can never be faulted for the tone he sets. It's always very consistent, and this was a film noir. And I really thought that Dr. Ritter was kind of the weakest character in this movie. She seemed like the mall. She seemed like the dame. The noir dame who's going to suck you in with her sexiness and shoot you. Dr. Ritter struck me as a jungle cat. He comes in and he decides he's going to tame this cat because he's been taming cats all his life. And he gets the jungle cat to purr and, and maybe even expose the belly. And then when the jungle cat bites him or slashes him, he's like, what the hell? And the jungle cat says, this is my nature. And you came with your hubris and believed I could be changed but you mustn't be surprised when I bite you, you know? Like, she was going to kill him because she's bad, and she's badder than he is, but he thought he was in control, and he obviously wasn't. And it seemed like she was kind of a caricature. Her motivations weren't terribly clear to me, whereas Stan's were. The real focus wasn't their dynamic to me, and even Molly didn't prove to be that important, other than to show us that he had cast off the last remnants of a level that he had once aspired to, right? 
He wanted to be a part of this carnival. And then he wanted to get this girl who was the most beautiful girl in the carnival. But when he graduates to a new level and a different level of con where the stakes are life and death and big money, then he casts her away or she decides to leave and, and we're kind of done with her character. And I felt that that was a lot of what this movie was, was kind of an on the road Jack Kerouac sort of meeting people, random people as he goes along his journey and then they we never hear from them again. Maybe one pops up and you're like, oh, what are you doing here? And they're like, well, I mean, the carnival was on vacation, so I took a vacation. <laughs> Molly may f seem like a secondary character because she seems to go along with Stanton's whims, but really she's a pretty powerful foil to Stanton because unlike Stanton, she knows who she is and where she's come from. And unlike Stanton, she actually really loves her spouse. She does what she does at the end because she loves him, even though it goes against every fiber in her being. And so it appears like she's weak because of all of the posturing and positioning of power from the other characters and even from the carnies themselves. But ultimately, she is our hero, really. I mean, in terms of like, if I want to get gushy about it, like she's our hero in terms of love. Even if her actions are unforgivable in playing part in the ruse against Ezra Grindel, like her motivation is pure. I thought as much as well. And so when she disappears, and it's fairly unceremonious, when he falls on hard times and ultimately has to crawl back to the circus or a circus, I really thought he was going in search of her. So her disappearing is part of my frustration with this movie in that it didn't come, it, it took us on a far flung journey that didn't bring us around enough for me to feel satisfied. I didn't understand how Stan got to a place where even as broken down as he was, he became the subject of the con. He's so hyper aware. And by this point, we're so hyper aware of the geek spiel that I was waiting for his angle. I was trying oh. to understand why he would agree. But at that point, Stan's broken. He's a broken man and he's accepting his fate. I knew that Stan was going to be the geek. I knew that that was the that was the only place where this movie could go. But I accepted it. I accepted being ahead of it. And I accepted all of the slow burn buildup to get to this point because the final scene was so satisfying. Everything in the movie was built for Stanton to accept that he is a bad dude and that this is what he was made for. Like, this is what he deserves. I, I agree. It was well set up. I felt like it was kind of an abrupt turn. It's not as though he got to the place where he was being conned by Buster Scruggs. No. He wasn't buying the sale. He knew the sale just yeah. as much as we did. And that was evidenced by the fact that he took the second drink of the tinctured alcohol. Mm. And knowing that he heard the spiel and you could see the recognition in Bradley Cooper's otherwise kind of dead eyes, the fact that he took the second drink of what he knew was the tainted alcohol was an indication that he willingly embraced this role because he had nowhere to go. He was still in on the con. He understands that this is his comeuppance. Yep. You know, once a carny, always a carny. And you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. <laughs> yeah, and just that he was a bad dude and it's a complicated experience to root for the antihero and then come to a place of acceptance of the antihero's fate and you can probably tell nightmare alley really worked for me and maybe it worked for me because i went in with low expectations because of my judgment of shape of water but amazing cast everybody's in this movie my love for bradley cooper is no secret <laughs> nightmare alley really worked for me in fact I think it is my favorite film of this award season. And I have taken a screen grab of your text where you said, and I quote, Nightmare Alley will do nothing at awards. You're wrong. And this is my best picture of 2021. I'm not saying it's not going to work for you as viewer. I'm going to stand by that text. We're going to see where it goes. But I think this one is going to fall through the weird, dirty, scummy crack in the floor. <laughs> and your rating for Nightmare Alley is? 
So Nightmare Alley came around. It took a long time to get there. And I can't say that I was completely convinced by the turn because I thought he had a little bit of fuel left in the tank. I thought we could go other places and he didn't have to be biting the heads off of chickens. But I liked watching this movie. I didn't know where it was going, so I didn't have a huge amount of stakes built in. There were recurrent themes and hubris and, and the father thing it was all all intact. Like I said, my favorite Guillermo del Toro movie. I thought that the stuff with Grindel and the wife and the execution of their plan as badly as it went was thrilling and scary and beautiful and nerve wracking and tense. And I thought it was a fitting denouement for this movie. I didn't know how much we needed beyond that because I think, I think it went on for another half an hour or something. But <laughs> even though it seems like everything was in place, I don't know how satisfying it was. It was like hearing a really long, detailed, unnecessary joke for the punchline to come around and be like, okay, but it didn't have to be that long. But the punchline worked, right? Yeah. Great performances, even from Bradley Cooper. Rooney Mara, great. Kate Blanchett, great. Uh, Peter Jenkins, Mary Steenberg, and Tim Blake, Nelson, Clifton Collins Jr. All people I like very much and was happy to see them. Ron Perlman, I guess. The, definitely a, a movie that clears the line, right? It was an all right movie. I don't mm. know that I would call it the best picture mm. of the year, but it wasn't a bad movie by any stretch. A um, little long, a little gross. And a little weird, but definitely an all right movie. And I was overall pretty happy with it. A little sprawling, but immersive, and it pays off. And there you have it. That's a review on Nightmare Alley, a Guillermo del Toro film starring Bradley Cooper and everyone else in Hollywood. You got an all right from Wes, which I think is a little stingy, and a good from Iris. Let us know what you think about Nightmare Alley at 818-835-0473 or whatevermovies at gmail.com. Hit us up on Instagram and Twitter at or whatever movies. And thank you for listening.